listening to the Animation Happy Hour. A podcast where we talk about breaking into the animation industry over a couple of drinks. All opinions and views expressed in this podcast are solely our own and are not representative of the companies for whom we work. My name is Garrett. And I'm Ben. And I'm Katie. And we are all currently feature film animators working at Disney. So today we are here sipping on something we like to call the critiqueria. <laughs> oh, Real Garrett, special. what is a critiqueria? A critiqueria isn't your classic Wait, critiqueria, right? <laughs> <laughs> what <did I> <laughs> we keep saying critiqueria. <laughs> 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 Margarita critiqueria. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Critiqueria. Yeah. I'm sorry. If and it is, right before. I'm, I'm 100% saying it right all yeah, of the time, I'm Ben. Sorry. Um, <laughs> It's it's not just a classic margarita because, you know, okay, we have, you know, you have a shot, right? And you feel like you need to add something more to it, right? So, what do you do? You get some critique. That's exactly right. right. That's so, exactly right. you know, you have your classic margarita, you have your tequila, triple sec, you got your lime juice, but you want something more. You oh. add, and the critique is represented by a splash of Corona. Mm. So, it's a little bit of a margarita with a little <laughs> bit of critique. In that's, there. Hey, add a little texture. It adds some that's, texture. It brings it to critique. the next level. That's, right. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> this is Animation Happy Hour, a sponsored cocktail, which you can purchase from our website. <laughs> For nine ninety nine. No. I can't say In I, the future, TBD. <laughs> <laughs> can't say I 100% follow the reasoning behind the critiqueria, but Katie loves delicious. It. We're each about yes. two or three critiqueritas in, so... Please forgive us. If That's we... just a lie. We're one critique. <laughs> and... <laughs> trying to make us, trying to justify the level of insanity. We're just we're bad here. at recording. <laughs> so thank you, Garrett, for crafting these delicious critiqueritas. Of course. Thank Anytime. You there. Of course. And with that, I will kick off this month's episode topic, which is applying to jobs. I think... Woo! <laughs> I think the number one request we've received from our listeners is talk about the nitty gritty logistics of applying to jobs. Right. Um, so we're hoping to cover in this episode things like how to craft a cover letter, a resume, um, how to have a successful interview and write a good thank you note. Basically, anything and everything that pertains to applying to a job that is not like the actual demo reel or portfolio or artist work involved. Right. Um, we very, very like thoroughly covered the nitty gritties of putting together an animation demo reel in episode four with Guillermo Carriaga. So we absolutely recommend you animators out there listen to that episode. Definitely. Um, yeah, for sure. And we hope to cover other types of portfolios and demo reels for other disciplines in the future. Um, and we think this episode will cover a lot of aspects of professionalism and yeah. etiquette. Um, so hopefully this is relevant for you guys. Uh, yeah. So to begin, we are going to start at the beginning, which is applying to jobs. Where do I start? Uh, so, you know, you've been in school, you're working hard. Every family gathering you've ever gone to, your uncle has asked you, do you have a job yet? You say no. <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? So yeah, I know it, it can be super intimidating when it's just like, you know, you're working hard, you're doing your thing, then find a job. And it's like this big abstract weird thing. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to break it down for you as best we can into little bite-sized uh, steps or pieces you can take. Uh, do you take bite-sized steps? Bite I guess. Steps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so to begin with, I think Garrett had some really great advice on kind of how he organized everything. Totally. Yeah. When I came to LA looking for jobs, I think I covered this a little bit in some previous episodes. But one of the things I did that really helped me, and it sounds super kind of simple and, and obvious, but it helps me help me organize things is just make a Google sheet, which is basically an Excel spreadsheet and just put in studio names of, you know, studios that you're interested in, put in one column, the name of the studio, put in another column, like what that studio, what type of work they do, for instance, VFX, animation, whatever, you know, type of industry it is, then put in another column, like the last time you contacted them or reached out, you can also put a notes column for maybe you know, someone who's at that studio. So just be organized about you know, the studios that you're looking into. And for reference, I think I mentioned this in another episode, I had a hundred studios there yeah, uh, in that awesome. list. Yeah, which was great. And then you, it it's crazy because when you have little experience, it might take, you might get five people who respond to you out of that 100. Mm -hmm. So if you're like applying to like Pixar 
and you're disappointed, you know, that they haven't necessarily gotten back to you. And that's the only studio you got to. It's like there you're going to probably need to branch out to mm-hmm. a lot of other studios. And yeah, so I think just having a Google Sheet uh, or some sort of document to organize your applications is a really good idea. And you might be wondering, how do I even know that a company has posted or listed a job? And we have some really good tips on how to find that out. Um, there is an amazing spreadsheet maintained yeah. by, oh gosh, do any of you guys know his name or <laughs> where he is? We should have looked up his name before this, but <laughs> it exists. Yes, <laughs> yes, there's an amazing Google spreadsheet, which is kind of crowdsourced, which is sort of this in incredible comprehensive list of all all over the world too job listings it's yeah not, it's organized yeah. by um, location and job title and we will share that in the show notes so you guys should absolutely check that out that's really the most comprehensive and up-to-date list i've ever seen for animation job listings but other great resources are um, you can join women in animation which is an amazing social it's network really great you don't have to be a woman no nope. they accept all members um and And they send out, I think, maybe a weekly email about um, recent job listings and companies post to women in animation. So that's a great way to stay up to date. Is that specifically LA-based? Oh, good question. Because it might be. It might be, which is, it's fine. It's relevant. I just thought about that. Because I think they're a fantastic resource that I've used, too. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. sure, But we'll we'll take a look. Keep in mind, for sure. Um, and then I would also recommend that you guys follow the top companies, LinkedIn's and Twitter's because that's often the very first place that they'll post. Uh, and then you get a notification when a job posting has been listed. And that's a like really fast and immediate way to stay up to date on job listings. It's also one thing we didn't even write here, but what occurred to me is when I was looking for work, I kind of treated looking for work like a job in that Mm -hmm. I would, from Monday through Friday, nine to five, I would be, you know, scavenging for work basically. And then Saturday and Sunday, I'd take a break. And -hmm. I think it's helpful to treat it like that so it doesn't consume your entire life. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. You need a little bit of a break sometimes. And I think you know, it is, it's a full-time job looking for work, yeah. right? I mean, do you guys have similar experiences? Yeah. That, that's a great way to look at it because I feel like if, if you aren't super structured with it like that, like, um, it can very easily become, oh, I should be looking for a job for 24 seven until I have yeah. a job. Right. And then that's such a ridiculous, impossible standard to me. You end up like not doing it at all, you know, right. or like you'll look for 15 minutes and you don't, you're like, oh, maybe I should be, you know, messing with my reel instead or tweaking my resume or instead but yeah if you i so i think it's super valuable to be really structured like you were and and say okay i have my stuff i'm going to now like you said nine to five just to just apply, apply. To jobs yeah and you can even have a goal of like i'm gonna reach out to i think i at the time i had like 10 companies a day which sounds crazy now but mm-hmm. it could take you know it could take that um, oh, for sure it's, it's really hard to to break in yeah. yeah, totally. Right after um, my internship at Blue Sky, when I was freelancing in New York for a while, um, yeah, like I said, I was freelancing, so I didn't have a, a full time full time job. And same thing, I was I was sending stuff out to all kinds of different companies across the U.S. And yeah, you just kind of have to play a numbers game, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. You never know if you don't have a foot in the door anywhere yet, or anything, nothing to go off of. Um, you just kind of have to go for quantity and and, and yeah. work from there, for sure. Yeah. And we should mention, too, another great way to find out about job openings is, frankly, through people that work at those companies. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about networking later on in this episode. But in general, if you have a pretty robust network and you have friends at various studios, those friends are going to be the first people to know about those listings. Um, I know, at least for Disney, Gert and I can speak to, like, when they are about to hire new animators, they often reach out internally first and ask people for referrals. So that's one reason why you kind of want to have a robust network and know people really all around the industry um, just to widen just, yeah, the recommendations you'll receive. So, I mean, your first few jobs are definitely going to be through those types of referrals, which is actually another section that is later in this uh, (laughs) podcast. (laughs) We'll put a pin in that. We'll come back to that. So really quickly, before we get to that stuff, um, we'll talk about um, it's very possible that when you're applying for jobs, you'll be applying to places that are not currently 
that are not where you are currently living, right? So, right. like, speaking for all of us, we're not uh, West Coast natives. Um, so, uh, you know, you might even be applying to a studio in a different country from where you currently are. So, one of the things we want to talk about is kind of the pros and cons of how much information to give <laughs> at oh, what right. point in the process, yeah. you know? And one of the things that um, I know we talked about a lot at school was uh, whether you should put your address on a resume or cover letter or mm -hmm. something when you're applying to, you know, in our case, we were going to school in Georgia, Katie and I, mm -hmm. and then applying to a lot of places on the West Coast. So we're like, oh, shoot, should we say we're in Georgia? We Should we say like up front that we, you know, we would require a certain amount of time to probably move? Mm -hmm. and the reasoning being that sometimes companies want to hire a position for the following week or something. Yeah. And they might specifically be looking for local candidates. That's absolutely right. Yeah. So I think we, we kind of chatted about it informally as a group here. And I think where we landed was that if you don't have to volunteer that information and you feel like that information won't expressly help you, yeah. you know, like if you're applying to a place in LA and you're not in LA, <laughs> um, that go ahead and leave it off. You don't have to volunteer it if <laughs> right. you think it's not going to help. Like if you're in a different country, but you feel like you'd be willing to or able to move to another country, just say, eh, and, and it's not, it's not required on any application materials. Just leave it off. Let your resume and demo reel speak for itself. Absolutely. And then hopefully, if the company becomes interested in you, you can then you know take the next step and say, "Well, mm -hmm. I happen to be international, so X, Y, and Z is involved with me working in the U.S." Uh, and take it from there. Basically, what we want to avoid is a company passing on your reel or not even considering you because you're be not exactly local. because you're international or you're in a different state. Um, when you have the chops and you, you would be a great, you know, addition mm -hmm. to the team and they normally would consider you at the, mm -hmm. at the point you are. So yeah, let them hopefully fall in love with your work before they have to figure out the logistics of getting you there. And, uh, and we're definitely not saying lie about it. Right. Don't <laughs> it's lie. It's a fine line we're writing. <laughs> yeah. But if you don't have to include it, you can feel safe to omit it. But yeah. if there's like literally an online form which says address, you should fill it out. <laughs> and usually jobs that require visa sponsorship, they will specify that we are not able to, you know, sponsor visas mm -hmm. now. So, I mean, you have to, we have a visa episode, mm -hmm. uh, episode three, I think. So, that's a little bit of a different case, but yeah, I mean, if maybe if you're in Connecticut and you, you're applying to a job in California and you, you think you can fly there or something in time for the interview, that might be something that makes sense to just not be totally upfront about where you're living. <laughs> <laughs> so point two, I already sort of started touching upon a little bit, which is all about networking and reaching out to studio recruiters and artists. Um, and this is, it's a little bit of a tricky topic because on one hand, I want to say network as much as you can because you want to have as many contacts as possible and all different companies in the industry because those are the people that will learn about the job listings first. But then on the other hand, there's kind of a fine line between like reaching out to people and spamming people. Right. Um, <laughs> like we all have kind of, I think, been in the position where someone reaches out to us and we just have a casual conversation with a friend at work. And then we sort of find out, Oh, the same person reached out to you as well. Isn't that funny? And they're sort of asking for the same advice. And, um, and it's, <laughs> this is so tricky because I want people to network, but that kind of thing almost crosses the line between like sort of not valuing people's time or not valuing mm -hmm. their advice or feedback because it just feels almost a little bit hollow. Like it's sort of transparent that you're trying to network as much as possible. And oh gosh, this is such a tricky thing. Yeah. It really is. Thing. Yeah. It's a fine because line. Because it is a balance. It's it's yeah. certainly not one way or the other. If it, we You don't want to say restrict who you're reaching out to yeah. because – of course, you want to cast a wide net, but at the same time, like you said, you want to walk that line of balancing. With, you don't want to become a spammer. 
and be like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, this person wrote to every single animator at the company, mm-hmm. so it's not worth your time. You know, they, right. you know, let one of the other 40 people <laughs> respond to them. Exactly. You know. Yeah. I will say like reaching out to a recruiter specifically, for instance, because it's literally their job to find artists. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I feel like it's okay to kind of not spam them, of course, but to reach out to them a couple times, uh, whatever, maybe once a month or something. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about artists, it's a little bit of a different situation. Like with an artist, the artist wants to feel that you're taking their advice and applying it forward. And when, like, I know I've taken the time to give advice to someone and then found out a week later they applied or they reached out to someone else and that kind of made it feel like, oh, the advice I gave them wasn't (laughs) valuable enough. Mm -hmm. Um, So you want to make sure if you're reaching out to an artist and trying to network with them that you are really actively taking their advice and applying it to your work. And that's something that is probably going to take time to apply um, because you might need to do a new demo reel piece or you might need to um, really revisit something on your reel. Um, So yeah, it kind of like immediately is sort of a red flag when we as animators talk amongst ourselves and find out, oh, this person like kind of reached out to all of us. Um, yeah. Right. I think a, a key thing would be be very methodical yeah. about who you're reaching mm-hmm. out to, right? So it's even it's it's not, you know, automatically a bad thing if you're reaching out to multiple people at the same studio, but you know, if I was reaching out to Katie and it, and I knew she worked at Disney and then I wanted to reach out to Garrett as well. I might even say in the email, hey, like I reached out to Katie to get her feedback on it. You know, I blah, blah, blah. She's helping me with X, Y, and Z, but I would also love your feedback on it. Um, versus I think what we really react the copy paste to it. Exactly. Like, <laughs> where it's just like, hey, I'm interested in Studio X right, <laughs> for right. X, Y, and Z. Give me your feedback. And then if somebody spends an hour and a half writing feedback to you, and they find that, and we do. By the way, yeah, I want to say that feed, feedback takes a long time. Yeah. Yes, if it's but, anything yeah. more than like a line of you know more appeal, like, <laughs> right. if it's like shot by shot, anything like that, where it's like you know, oh, I think you know X, Y, and Z about this, that takes forever. It, <laughs> it really yeah. does. And most people are a lot of people are happy to do it, but you just want to know that that feedback will then be valued, and you're not just. And that you really are looking for feedback and that it's not just like, hey, I'm asking you you for feedback just to make a contact and I don't really care what the feedback is. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a big difference between those two things. And we understand that um, sometimes you reach out to someone and they don't get back to you. Um, We've all been in that position before. So if that's happening to you, I would just say like, I don't know, maybe wait like a week or two between trying to reach out to different people rather than like sending the same email BCC to 50 (laughs) animators that somehow you found their email addresses all at the same time. I would try to reach out to kind of one person at a time. You want to feel like there's a reason the person is reaching out to you and that it wasn't just, you know, oh, I happened to see on LinkedIn that it said Disney next to your name. So I'm going to reach out to you and I don't really know anything about you. I don't really care who you are as long as you're there and can then give me a referral or something. Um, right. You want to know that there's a little layer of extra something. You know, it makes it so much more personal and so I feel like increases the likelihood so much that the person will then respond to you. Um, yeah. If it feels like you're really reaching out to them versus just copy and pasting a, totally. a, a generic right. email. Yeah. One piece of strategic advice about ne- networking that I would give is – um, maybe try to reach out to people at different studios because different studios have different sort of preferences and quirks that they're looking for. Um, some studios are known for naturalistic animation. Others are known for cartoony and that kind of thing. Very true, yeah. Um, so I would maybe be methodical about, oh, okay, I'm going to target one animator or a uh, storyboard artist or whatever at each studio and try to get their take, especially if you're applying to a number of companies, like we mentioned before. Um, I think that's a good time to, yeah, reach out to people at different companies and say, hey, I'm applying to this position and would love your advice on catering my real or portfolio to your studio. Um, and like Ben was saying just now, um, I think it's a very good idea to familiarize yourself with the person's work 
that you're reaching out to. A lot of us have our demo reels online um, or on our Instagrams. We posted our shots from movies and that kind of thing. So it it really goes the extra mile of personalizing your networking attempt to say, hey, I saw your shot on Instagram and I love X, Y, and Z about it. And I mean, flattery, it goes a long way. <laughs> We're very vain, all of yeah. us. <laughs> Definitely cater to people's narcissism. <laughs> and you'll hopefully see a better success rate with the response. Yeah. Well, you know, what? not only that, I feel like it, it shows that, okay, this person is actively, this person is proactive and knows what to look for when reaching out mm-hmm. to someone. Like, I think somebody reached out to you recently who was like, oh, I, it was cool that you went from stop motion to CG animation. Mm-hmm. And you're like, okay, th- that simple thing that they knew that about you, that yeah. was like, okay, this person took the time to figure out who I am and message me, mm-hmm. I'm going to message them back now, you know, and that yeah. immediately separated from them from, you know, a pack of people who are just like, I see you're at Disney. Please right. <laughs> connect with me. If you yeah. mention the critique Arita, you are an, it's oh an instant, <laughs> instant reply. God, hired. Hired at any of our studios. <laughs> <laughs> I should not say that legally, probably. <laughs> yeah. <but. laughs> Yeah, not really, but we'll try out. <laughs> you get major brownie points. Oh, that's right. That's yes. Just, just, yeah. <laughs> it's another thing to note, too, that, that networking with what we're talking about, um, a lot of the value in networking is the feedback. It's not necessarily like you're hired at, or we're trying to get you a job. It's like if you can reach out to someone who's in the industry now who has who's doing kind of like what you want to be doing, the value that they can bring is not like, I mean, yeah, it's it's recommending you for a job, but it, it just as valuable, I think, is the feedback they can give you to for you to get to that point. Mm-hmm. Um, so, in other words, take I guess the feedback that you you hear, uh, take it and try to really apply it and take it seriously. That's a really good point, and I think we, that's something we've touched on in previous episodes. Where you know, don't necessarily put your priorities all in the immediacy of how useful a contact is. Yeah. And, and it right. might not immediately be turned into a job. Um, and I'm just going to mention this person by name because I don't think, feel like she'd <laughs> oh, no. care, but I'll, I'll, I'll make sure with her first. But um, <laughs> there's an animator at DreamWorks, Kim, um, who knew uh, another animator there who, Kev Shorey, has been an animator at DreamWorks for oh, yeah. over 10 years for quite a while. He's a fantastic animator. And he met Kim, I think, when she was fairly fairly early on in her animation career. And they just kind of had this this consistent relationship for years and years. And now she's this incredible animator and, you know, and learned so much and is so talented. So when it came time that DreamWorks was hiring and she applied, he was like, oh, my God, That's this girl. Amazing. I've, like, known of her for years. She's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Let's get her in here. Um so yeah, I know it can be tough to hear because everybody, you want a job right now. If that's you need the a hard job. thing, and right? that's certainly understandable. People are like, and, "Why are you talking about that? I want to. Yeah, I, need, yeah. I need to pay off my student loans." Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it is so tough, but ultimately, you know, life is long. You gotta, yeah. <laughs> you gotta play the long game um, and organize those uh, contacts in that Google Sheet <laughs> that we there talked about earlier. I'm sure she had column eleven, Kev Short. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what, probably. <laughs> One thing I wanted to mention about sort of reaching out to recruiters, especially if you're reaching out to recruiters out of the blue, is probably the most professional way to do so is to reach out to recruiters over LinkedIn um, and send that message to connect and write an intro message. I would avoid just sort of the default, like, send a request and leave the default message, which is, I'd like to connect with you over LinkedIn and try to write something personal. Um, I know there's kind of a character count, I think, for if you've never connected with someone before and how long a message you can send them. But just try to keep um, a short and professional message. And hopefully that will kind of open up the doors to a longer conversation where you can elaborate a little bit more about who you are and um, what job you're applying to. And Frankly, I would maybe avoid reaching out to recruiters over their personal accounts, like finding them on their Facebook or... Or their OK Cupid account. Yes, definitely. <laughs> avoid dating sites and, um, and maybe avoid like a personal Instagram. 
Um, just because that's kind of a recruiter's personal domain and it's probably reserved for friends and family. Um, and yeah, I just think uh, LinkedIn is kind of a safer way to reach out to people. Um, and actually kind of on the social media note, that ties beautifully into our next topic, which is just kind of talking about social media in general and being aware of your web presence as you're applying to jobs. Right. Um, like you, it's kind of fairly safe to assume, or I would err on the side of assuming that recruiters or people that are reviewing candidates, like the heads of animation or whoever, um, they will probably look you up on social media if you're a serious candidate. Um, And you want to make sure that your web presence is very professional. (laughs) So you maybe want to avoid having pictures of yourself partying or um, definitely want to avoid your specific opinions and commentary on films, especially if you do not like a film or that kind of thing, because you risk, you risk insulting someone's work or that kind of thing. So absolutely try to keep your web presence professional, maybe even make your Facebook page private. Um, so that all that shows up is your profile picture and whatever kind of default is up when it's a private page. Um, I know certain people even keep two separate Instagram accounts where one right. is a private Instagram account, which requires a request, which is for their personal life and others. Um, and they additionally have a public Instagram account for their artwork or that kind of thing. So that might be something you want to consider. So yeah, kind of included in this subject, we wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, we kind of live in a time right now where it's very common to be given constant status updates and like, mm-hmm. what's going on in my life right now? Um, and something we have seen in the past that we would kind of caution against is people posting about like being in the interview process right now. And um, <laughs> bad idea, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of a weird, tricky thing because, like, on the surface level, it's not like there's nothing like obviously illegal or terrible about it, but it's just kind of a, you know, best practices are <laughs> to kind of play your cards a little closer to the vest. And if you're interviewing somewhere, just go through an, the interview process and, and wait till you get the job to post about it or something. Um, yeah. You just never want, the ri- want to run the risk of rubbing someone the wrong way. And and I don't know. You just never know what could happen. If you come off as like too confident or something that, yeah. oh, you know, I'm definitely going to get this job or, or vice versa or what. It's, it's just kind of safer to, you know, practice restraint and mm-hmm. – uh, And not post about that stuff when you're in the process. Um, Again, just because, Mm -hmm. yeah, that has happened here and there. And there is a chance for it to be looked on, looked upon in a negative way. (laughs) So why risk that, I think? And also, I think (laughs) kind of an an unexpected result would be I, I wouldn't want anybody to say you're interviewing at Sony or something. You're like, you know, oh, it's happening. I'm interviewing at Sony. I can't wait. You know, this is my dream. And then it doesn't work out. And then two weeks later, you're interviewing at Disney. <laughs> the <laughs> Disney recruiter checks your account and they're like, wow, okay. So they never really wanted to work here. They wanted to work at Sony. Right. You know, it, it can yeah. backfire in that way too. So, you know, just, you know, err on the side of caution and then, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely avoid any situation in which you're like putting pressure on a studio to accept you. So if like you have a stash which is like, oh, I'm interviewing um, for Pixar and I'm in the final rounds, fingers crossed or something, <laughs> even though that's like such like an, a hopeful post, it does kind of put awkward pressure on the studio to accept you or anyone who's at that studio to accept you. So I would just err on the side of just, yeah, being private with that information and you never know like um it can be tough like with your friends or peers to see that you're interviewing and you don't kind of want to make people feel bad about themselves if they didn't get the same interview so i just think it's yeah way better to err on the side of humility um and just kind of speak privately with friends and family if you're like going through an interview and you need support Um, rather than posting publicly on social media. Do you guys think it's a good recommendation for people to kind of start their artistic social media stuff 
in school. Do you think that's a good idea? I think it's a cool idea just so recruiters or artists that you're networking with can kind of track your progress and trajectory. Yeah, I definitely don't think it hurts. Yeah, and I wouldn't put like undue pressure on yourself, you know, to develop right. this super famous, super successful social media, you know, <laughs> influencer status. You know, <laughs> I'm an thing. influencer. But, um, but yeah, it's another great way to be noticed. And, and uh, you know, ultimately, the most important thing is still, if you're an artist, like your reel or your portfolio or cover letter resume, all that stuff. Um, but it's great supplemental material and you are almost guaranteed they're going to look it up. Um, I think when I, between when I interned to when I worked at PSYOP to when I worked at DreamWorks, Mm -hmm. every single company um, I worked for knew of stuff I had posted online. So there you go. Like it's huge. So Mm -hmm. you, so just be mindful of that. And again, we don't say that to put undue pressure on you that everything's amazing and you have like a Corey Loftus level account where like every <laughs> post you do is getting, you know, 15,000 likes. But uh, yeah, just know that that stuff is being seen. Mm-hmm. So let's say now you have found job listings, you've done your homework to network with recruiters, you've made sure your social media is professional. What's the next step is you actually apply to the job listing. And usually that involves a cover letter of some kind. So this next topic will kind of cover the ins and outs of a cover letter, the structure of a cover letter, and what to include, what to avoid, et cetera. So very briefly, um, the basic cover letter, I think, kind of covers who are you, what is your background in animation, where did you go to school, what kind of jobs have you had, why are you interested in this specific position, and what are your qualifications for that job. Um, We will absolutely include example cover letters and some of our own personal cover letters that have found success because it's way easier to write a cover letter kind of modeling off of someone else's cover letter. Um, But yeah, those are kind of the basics of a cover letter. Yeah, and it's more or less important depending on what position you're in because we kind of joked while we were coming up with the planning of this episode, like... In animation specifically, we sometimes don't know if the recruiters or (laughs) the supervisors look at the cover letter more so than the demo reel, but perhaps for, you know, production or other positions within animation, it could be very relevant. I know, you know, certainly for me as a TA that I think my cover letter did make a difference because it wasn't purely animation, it was other stuff. So I think it's, it's good practice to write the cover letter, maybe have someone look at it, get your friend or, you know, someone to take a look at it. Even if they're not reading it, yeah. it's probably a good idea just to get like, get another pair of eyes on it. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. It's one of those things where a good cover letter will never hurt you, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> but right. it will either be neutral or it will benefit <laughs> you, mm-hmm. yeah. you know? So uh, we certainly wouldn't recommend risking not having one and then suffering for it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because, yeah, even though it is debatable whether, you know, if you're, say, a character animator and you have a great reel and stuff, whether they'll read your cover letter, Mm -hmm. it doesn't hurt. As a former PA, I would say a cover letter is very important for production management positions because in production management, you are it's basically a job all around uh, communication and writing effective emails. That's so a cover letter point. really point. bears a lot of importance um, and can say a lot about a candidate. So that's a position where you really want to make sure your cover letter is as good as you can make it. That's, speaking of that, I just was reminded briefly of, do you remember when I was applying to Leica and the recruiter at the time uh his, I won't give his exact name, but his his first and last name was kind of two first names. A firsty, firsty. Exactly. <laughs> and I accidentally said, dear so-and-so, and I said his last name, like it was his first name. <laughs> and I was mortified. And I was like, that's it? I, I no. missed out on the internship. That's it. And Katie was like... <gasps> Well, it's okay. It's not like you're in production. Like, they, they don't care about that. But I, I think that the spirit of what she was saying That's was really that, funny. Yeah, definitely. It it matters for everyone, right? But for production in particular, I mm-hmm. think, 
all the little extras like the cover letter, any sort of communication you have with Mm -hmm. recruiters and stuff is especially important for exactly the reason Katie just said. So Mm -hmm. that's the job as a whole is communication. Mm -hmm. Like super basic things that you want to avoid are spelling errors, grammatical errors, listing the wrong studio. (laughs) Which has happened. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, For sure. (laughs) Happened a lot. Um, Yeah, absolutely. Listing the wrong name as Ben just mentioned. So absolutely get somebody (laughs) As Ben accidentally did. (laughs) (laughs) To double check your letter. I think all of us use our significant others to read and reread our cover letters. So just find somebody who you trust to read your information. (laughs) I would also be very careful about sort of crossing the line between passion and fangirling slash fanboy. (laughs) I will speak very candidly and personally about (laughs) previous cover letters I've written. I think the very first cover letter I wrote for Pixar, which I was like fresh out of college and had no qualifications, had some really embarrassing line, which was like, oh, I lie awake at night thinking about the possibilities with my heart pounding and blah, blah, blah. And my it, God, that, it's like Hemingway. Oh, God. <laughs> and that, like, absolutely came on too strong. I don't think I I think even... you got to go further. <laughs> I think you need more enthusiasm. I, I think I really, like, Im- I don't even think I got a response to that letter. So that's an example of a line you don't want to cross. Yeah. That's a really good point, though, to bring up. Yeah, and that's yeah something we, we were talking about before. Um, <laughs> off the mic. <laughs> Not that you can listen. <laughs> off to mic. Um, we were talking about the balance between um, what the heck is the word? Interest and fanboy. Interest and fanboy, but also uh, confidence and oh, humility. humility. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, because obviously, in the cover letter and your resume and with your portfolio or whatever, you want to communicate to the company, "I can do the job you have." Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I will come in, and I can I can give you what you need. But then you also don't want to be like, I'm the best thing you've ever seen. Like, as soon as I come in, I should be in charge of five to 10 people and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> like, so it, and it's certainly a balance, right? But you, that is something, if at all possible, you want to convey in your cover letter. Um, and later on in your interview, if you get one that like, hey, I think I can help out the company because of X, Y, and Z. I've had this experience or whatever in my coursework. I can do this. But I also very much realize that, you know, I, there's a lot of, you know, areas for me to learn and grow as as an artist or as yeah. a production person mm-hmm. or whatever. And I feel like this company will help me grow because of X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Um, so you kind of have to walk that line. And it's certainly tricky because, again, like we've said before, everything is gray. You kind of want to be in that middle ground. But I think if you, if you can get that across as being comp confident in your competence yet humble and open to learn and be critiqued uh that's kind of the sweet spot i would also say kind of harking back to one of the previous points which was try not try to avoid putting pressure on a studio to accept you Mm -hmm. is you want to avoid that in your cover letter as well i would avoid language which is like this is the only studio that i want to work for or this is my favorite studio or blah 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 anything of that kind of Sore could be kind of dangerous. And that is a really good, really tricky point as well. Because on one hand, it's the same balancing act where you want to say there is something specific about your studio that I really love and a reason I would really love working there above all other studios. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the same thing. You don't want to come off as like so intense that you say like, (laughs) If I'm not working for you, I'm going to be homeless on the street <laughs> because, like, you're the only job that matters to me, you know? Right. So, yeah, Tricky, you, yeah, you definitely want to say, like, hey, this is a job. I understand, but I would particularly like to do this job mm-hmm. for you because of X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a really good point. When all else fails, too, it's like just be genuine. Be yeah. genuine in what you want. And I think studios will respond to that. If you, I mean, mm-hmm. when you're right out of school, you're so enthusiastic about wherever you want to work. And I think, I think people love that. Like, that's yeah. such a valuable thing because when you work in this industry for a while, people can get more 
you know, the stereotype is like they get jaded, they stop stop wanting to, to stop wanting to work at, at these places. And I think have enthusiasm, but yeah, try to temper it because yeah, you don't want to come on too strong. Yeah. For cover letters, I would also say, um, and we've talked about this before, is try to do some research on the company and maybe use the cover letter as an opportunity to kind of show that you are very familiar with the company and what's happening at the studio and what future projects are there, who's kind of in leadership. Um, I think in the past I've sort of, I've written to companies and said like, oh, as an aspiring female animator, like I'm really encouraged to see like, X, Y, and Z in leadership. And um, it's really encouraging to see women in leadership positions at this company and that kind of thing, which kind of showed that I was familiar you with knew about it. I knew yeah. about them. I knew who was in leadership and um, had done kind of the homework on the company. So maybe one or two lines that show, oh, you're really familiar with this company is a good idea. That's a fantastic point. And I'm reminded of specifically when you applied to Laika and you mm. knew they were making Kubo and the two strings. And it was about a character who played the Shamisan and your brother, my brother in law. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Kitty and I are married. And that, <laughs> but, Just another. They're like, Jesus, I know you say this every episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, that he plays Shamisan. And yeah. yeah, so it was a great little tidbit just to be like, hey, there is something personal wait, wait, there's wait, a wait. personal connection between go ahead what what's going on oh you didn't know about this oh, i feel like we told you. yeah he plays the shamisen which is the instrument that kubo plays yeah oh so when kitty was applying to Leica, she was like she was like oh my god i have this like amazing personal connection to you yeah and it oh was oh my gosh yeah, i didn't know that. this <laughs> yeah yeah it's amazing Pretty cool right yeah. Yeah. wow okay and cool. when we found out about their next movie we were like are you kidding me? Like yeah, he meant to be. Yeah, he plays Shami son like and fate. he's being guarded by like a cool beetle and a monkey. Like and you know, oh we love like creature stuff. We loved yeah. yeah, all that we knew about that world a little bit because of your brother Jamie. And yeah. Wow. So wow. Obviously, so cool. that was like a very uh, <laughs> choice <laughs> position to be in. Yeah. But anything you can look for like right. that, any sort of personal connection is so valuable yeah. because it puts you you know, puts you in a different league than the people who are just like, I want to work here because you're great. And, mm -hmm. you know, the very general sort yeah. of stuff. What it kind of boils down to is that you put more thought into this letter and you're not just copying and pasting the generic letter and changing totally. the studio name. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The next thing we wanted to talk about um, is kind of references. And, you know, this is a thing where you, you might get asked by a studio when you're applying to a job to provide you know, references. And those are people who can vouch for your work. And they're typically people you would ask, you know, your professors or people you've worked with that know your work. And mm -hmm. the studios want to get a sense of if they can trust you. So they'll <laughs> go to this reference and ask them about your work. Um, but it's sort of weird because we, we kind of, we can talk about it, but there's sort of like the formal references that you'd apply with. And that's you know, the people you'd prov you would provide the studio with your references. But then there's sort of an unofficial referral process, yeah. which is like people who you might encounter in, uh, how would you guys, this is a hard one to, to differentiate. I'd say maybe a reference is a bit more passive and a referral is more like active. Like a referral is often, yeah, like Katie said, a person who is at the company who will say, I recommend... Mm -hmm. Katie Lowe because of X, Y, and Z. I know her from this. Whereas a reference is like, hey, if you want studio, <laughs> here's a person you can con you can contact and ask them about me. Yeah, and who knows give you me very an, well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I want to apply to Disney, right, and they ask me for two references, I will provide that. But if someone at Disney knows about me, mm -hmm. they might they're my referral and they would be the primary person to recommend me. Yeah. Don't know if that's making sense, but we can keep going on with I mean, it. No, that's cool. Yeah. It's, it's funny because we were talking about this before. It's this weird thing where technically references are kind of like more official. Mm -hmm. like, I'm giving you these two people who you can contact to ask about me and they will be my ambassadors. 
But then the referral is, it's like less official because it's just like, oh, I know this person at the company and they'll like be my uh, ambassador there. But it's arguably much more valuable. It because is. Because obviously yeah. having someone at the In company the company. is so valuable. Yeah, so... It's a it's a weird, it's a weird topic. It's yeah. like, it sounds simple, but it's kind of weird when you break it down <laughs> to basic language like yeah. that. I mean, regardless of across the board, if your reference or if your referral is at the company that you're applying to, that's more beneficial. Yeah. Totally. A oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Especially because, like you were saying, like at Disney and like a number of studios at DreamWorks as well, um, oftentimes the companies will be like, okay, we're looking for – a new modeler or something. So they'll open it up internally to all the modelers mm -hmm. they have and, so, and say, hey, do you know of anybody who would be good for this? And then, mm -hmm. and yeah, they definitely, I would say, prioritize those people mm -hmm. that are referred to them. And then if they can't find anyone or, the, or if they need for legal reasons or whatever to officially post it, they'll post it online and then, yeah, kind of open the gates for whatever. But yeah, referrals mm -hmm. are... Super important because if Very you already know someone who works well within the company and has a great personality and is easy to work with, chances are that person will be very reliable in recommending another person who they think uh, can function in the same way. Yeah. And I think we all can speak anecdotally to this topic. Like for me, I've had two instances where a referral was really effective um, the first one, which is one of my favorite stories about kind of my career trajectory, is when I was looking for PA jobs um, a couple or I guess now about three years ago, I really like on a whim, I went to a women in animation screening of Zootopia and I knew that Byron Howard, the director was going to be in attendance. And again, on a whim, I kind of wrote a cover letter and printed off my resume. And after the screening of Zootopia, I introduced myself and I was so nervous and I was like shaking. Um, but we had like a lovely little intro conversation and I gave him my cover letter and resume. And then lo and behold, a week later, I got an email, which the subject was, hi, it's Byron from Disney. <laughs> and wow. yeah. it was an email where he was referring me to the recruiter responsible for production management. And I mean, I can't. You must have freaked out. <laughs> I what? totally freaked yeah. out. Oh, my I gosh. I can't even quantify, like, how valuable that was. That's because crazy. Because that was, like, absolutely the best referral I could get. Um, <laughs> Just the director. I, yeah. <laughs> I remember you forwarded that email to be like, oh, my God, Byron responded. And I was like, are you effing kidding me? Like, I was like, <laughs> at PSYOP at the time, I was like, what? Is this <laughs> like and and I think like a month later, Byron won the Oscar for Zootopia. It was like and I was the like, same week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the same, Not a big deal. Like this guy, this guy, like you just. That's uh, awesome. Howard, I love you forever. Hey, he's <laughs> yeah. going to come on the podcast. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm i going to go ahead and say this. We haven't vetted it prior to the, our recording, but I would say certainly we talk a lot about the the correct way to market yourself and and put yourself out there and you certainly want to do it methodically like we said and sensitively but I would say overall fortune favors the bold right and like yeah. you have to put yourself out there and Katie went to this women in animation thing. Yeah. It, there was no guarantee she'd be able to talk to anybody of, of any significance or anything. But, you know, was proactive and, you know, printed off her resume and cover letter and, you know, had the <laughs> the cojones. <Gall>. Yeah. <laughs> Gall. I was watching you. <laughs> to, um, yeah. You know, to walk up and talk to this guy. So. I say That's that awesome. just because awesome. I, I know personally, I always felt like, oh, I'm not good with networking. I'm just going to go home and work on my reel and kind of be in my own world. And and there's certainly some value to that. But, you know, once you reach a certain point, you you need to just work on putting yourself out there and mm -hmm. putting your best foot forward. And, and I think Katie is a fantastic example of that. Yeah, I would add that 
I mean, one of my favorite mantras, which I can't remember if I've mentioned it before, is luck favors the prepared as well, which is oh, yeah. like if I... That's a better one. <laughs> Cut that in. <laughs> <laughs> but like at the time when I gave Byron my cover letter and resume, like I had already been a PA at Blue Sky. I had gone through the MFA program in animation. So I did at the time have the qualifications. And then at that point it just was a matter of getting the right connections and (laughs) that's a very good distinction did we talk about the lightning rod at all oh is that something that we should mention it i forgot who maybe it was isabel someone talked about it but it's exactly what you're saying it's basically like looking for a job or opportunity is like holding a lightning rod out and actually getting offered the position is like lightning striking. Like you can't make lightning strike, right? right? But you're increasing your likelihood exactly. by standing or there with the rod and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's that's a very good distinction. Have you guys ever had like referrals that really made a difference in your career or anything like that? Yeah, for sure. I remember when I was applying to DreamWorks um for the animation technical assistant position. One of the things I was really insecure about was my rigging experience because it was sort of half animation, half rigging. And one of the people I was interviewing with was Rob O'Neill, um, who is at DreamWorks, who's like a, a crazy, amazing rigger there. Um, but I remember seeing the list of people who I'd be interviewing with, and I was kind of insecure about that part of it. But one of the first things I, you know, I heard when I met with him was like, oh, are you, do you know Phil McNagney, who's, who, who, like, basically, who was a teacher I had at NYU, and it turned out that um, Rob was, like, roommates with Phil and had talked to Phil about me before the interview. Yeah. Which was amazing, and it it kind of, I guess, Phil, you know, said some nice things about me, and that really helped um, give Rob an impression of me. So I got to say that, like, all those experiences you have in school and, you know, in your or wherever are going to lead up. It's like the butterfly effect, right? Like they'll, um, people will ultimately find out about you through these other experiences and referrals. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we touched upon it a little bit in our things we wish we knew in school, which was like that your professors are going to be probably your first referrals because you don't have job industry experience and they yeah. are the people that are most familiar with who you are as a person and your work. Yeah, totally. Speaking of other specific uh, examples of where referrals helped us out, uh, I'll speak for Katie and myself. (laughs) (laughs) We had a buddy. um, Actually, maybe Katie, you should talk about this because it was because of you. Oh, go for Um, it. We remember, so Katie and I were both at SCAD and we had – we found out about uh, this SCAD alumni, alum, <laughs> who, <laughs> who was at Leica. His name was Dan McKenzie. His name still is Dan McKenzie. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, um, so we reached out to him. And Katie, I feel like an imposter because it was largely you <laughs> who like orchestrated this. Well, Can you I talk about it a little first. bit? Yes. Yeah, I reached out there to Dan go. Cold. He had his. Um, demo reel online, which included his email address. So I reached out to him out of the blue and it gave him background on um, who I was and how I was currently a student at SCAD. And here's my demo reel. And I'm really passionate about pursuing Leica. And Dan so kindly um, got back to me and gave me feedback and also ultimately referred me to the recruiter and to the top animators who were part of the real review process. So thank you, Dan McKenzie. (laughs) I've said it before. (laughs) Um, You made my career. So thank you. Um, And then Ben also decided to or decided to apply to the facial animation internship. So I literally referred you to Dan, I think, and said, oh, you know what? My boyfriend's also applying to Leica. Actually, you know what? To be extra cautious and to not put pressure on Dan, remember we reached out to him individually. Oh, And you were like, here's Dan's... Remembering. Yeah, here's Dan's contact info. You should reach out to him, and then later we'll reveal that Oh, okay. we are it. one. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, so cool. yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, then I reached out to him, 
And yeah, luckily he was nice enough to respond. <laughs> I was like, I was like, oh my god, if he doesn't respond to me, I'm going to die. <laughs> like he's like, Katie, you're great, Ben. Oh, I didn't get the email. <laughs> no. No, don't <laughs> but, put that pressure on yourself. But, yeah, no. yeah. yeah, but yeah, he responded luckily, and he was very nice. And then yeah, eventually we revealed that we were together. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, he recommended both of us to Leica, and he was hugely instrumental in yeah. both of us uh, getting the internship there, which then I feel like definitely helped set us up for future internships and job opportunities because, um, mm-hmm. yeah, like we said before, just any sort of referral is so valuable because that's a person that's already in there doing well mm-hmm. at a company and is getting along with the soups and supervisor, or <laughs> soups and supervisor, <laughs> soups and heads of right. department. Um so yeah, that was that was super valuable. So that yeah. was my very big, very obvious uh, example of when a referral helped me. It was Dan McKenzie. Thanks, totally. Dan. And this kind of touches on a point, which is if you don't know someone at a company, it might be a good idea to see if there's someone who went to your alma mater and your school yeah. because they're sort of <laughs> like automatically going to be biased towards helping you and like yeah. um, more sympathetic to your situation because they know like what the program's like and what you've been through. Um, yeah. And we're all sort of like pulling for our own tribe and that kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> so Which, we, yeah, I think it's a good idea to hit up your um, school network and see who's at the companies that you're applying to. For sure. And I think any uh, like specificity is like the main underlying root of that. And we certainly want to be sensitive to, we understand there are a lot of people who are listening to this who maybe are at a school where they don't have a lot of alumni mm-hmm. at big studios and stuff. So, you know, if if you can connect with an alum, that's great. But the, the underlying thing, like we said, is specificity. If there's anything you can do to connect to the person you're reaching out to, mm-hmm. even if, if if it's just like, hey, I watched your reel and there's this specific shot I liked or specific model I liked, or you wrote this script for rigging. I thought was like particularly genius. Mm -hmm. Any specific thing you can do to connect with someone um, is so valuable. Okay. So next we wanted to talk about resumes and I know it may sound a little silly to be getting to it just now, (laughs) but uh, uh, applying to a job and resume is like our (laughs) middle point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Right. But, um, yeah, it is obviously incredibly important. And one of the main things we want to tackle with a resume is um, how, like, artistic versus boring boring, <laughs> boring or boilerplate you want to make it versus and, – and talk a little bit about – um, kind of what you want to have on there. We understand as a student that it's very possible that you have zero experience whatsoever. So mm-hmm. you're like, oh, do I put, you know, I worked in the, uh, <laughs> I worked at McDonald's for four right. years. Do I put that on there or <laughs> yeah. not? Or what? So we wanted to talk a little bit about that stuff. Yeah. I mean, as a student, I think the things that you would want to mention if you don't have any job experience is, did you work on a student film? Did you work on Mm -hmm. a collaborative project? Were you involved in any major organizations at your school that are relevant to your discipline? Like, were you someone who helped organize the career fair or anything that kind of shows relevance and leadership and, um, just sort of the initiative to be involved in the industry um, would be relevant. Um, What sort of coursework did you do during your time in school? Um, And it's not to say that you can't mention if you had like a part-time job as a student, but generally try to keep it relevant to the industry. Um, Yeah. I don't think it's automatically a bad thing, definitely, if you if you don't have any relevant experience, if you want to say, you know, yeah, I did work at McDonald's for two years, that at least shows, hey, you can maintain a job that you are might not be <laughs> particularly passionate about for multiple years, and you did well there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think something Katie said that was super valuable that is sometimes overlooked with resumes is, is that... It can be really nice to list like 
um, different um, details about your education. Mm -hmm. Um, So instead of just having in one line, you know, went to the University of whatever, Indiana, (laughs) or went to SCAD or whatever, um, it'll be good to kind of fill that if you feel like you need a little more meat (laughs) for your resume to fill it out, you you can totally go into a little more detail and be like, hey, I took... uh, this animation acting class or I, you know, Definitely. was active in, I did a little improv and that helped me because of X, Y, and Z. And, yeah. you know, whatever you can put on there to make yourself sound a little more attractive to a recruiter or to, a, you know, someone mm-hmm. in the industry is totally great. And, and don't feel like, I, don't, I feel like when I was in school, particularly, I always felt like there were kind of these super solid concrete norms of like, okay, Mm. I'm going to have one or two lines for my education and then three or four lines for relevant work experience and blah, blah, blah. But honestly, it's totally unique to your specific experience and don't feel like if there's something you've done or some experience you had that you specifically don't want to have on your resume, leave it off. That's totally fine. You know, it's, it's up to you how you want to portray yourself to a possible employer. I feel like it also varies widely based on what job you're going after, yeah, how much the point. resume is important. Because, you know, if you're an animator, for instance, and your your reel is just phenomenal. Like Garrett's reel. L- okay. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> but if, you're, if your reel is really great and then your resume, it looks like something you, you made out of in Microsoft Word or whatever, and there's no special design elements or whatever. No, I don't think people are going to really weigh that heavily versus maybe, you know, for instance, production where, you know, that's more important. It's like what other experiences in production have you that were relevant to this, to this position that you're applying for. Um, So it really kind of depends on what you're going after. I would say. It's worthwhile to mention just kind of the basics of a resume and what a resume should cover. Um, So generally you want to list your education um, and what school you went to and the dates at which you were there. And then any kind of professional experience or jobs you've had, the location of those, what the responsibilities you had were, the times at which you were at that company. And we will absolutely include example resumes, (laughs) even our own personal resumes, (laughs) to kind of show you um, what you might want to include and how you might want to format it or structure it. Um, Another thing you might want to include is what softwares you're familiar with. Um, As someone who used to work in production management, you might want to mention that you're familiar with Shotgun, which is like kind of the industry standard for production management software. As an animator, you like are probably proficient in like Maya or Blender or something, just anything um, that you're kind of familiar with is a good thing to mention under like the skills category. Um, Yeah. And I want to revisit the question of like, should you have a really well designed resume? Right. Um, Yes. I think it varies kind of depending on the position you're applying for. Like my resume, which you guys will see in the show notes or which I've used for production management and which I've used for animation is the most boring Microsoft Word black and white document you've ever seen. And it didn't hurt me because I think those positions are not necessarily looking for like a heavy design experience. Yeah. Um, that being said, for other positions, which maybe are more design related, like VizDev or um, graphic design or motion graphics or something like that. They might be expecting like a better designed resume. Um, but generally the rule of thumb is you want your resume to be skimmable, to be clear. I would caution against a resume that's longer than one page because oh, generally sure. the recruiters want to be able to glance at your resume and clean information very quickly. Especially if you're a student. Right. Like there's zero reason for it to be on, for it to be beyond one page if you're a student. Maybe if you're like super veteran and you've souped 12 different movies, you can have them all listed and you're, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, have it extend beyond one page. But yeah. So we talked a little bit about, 
you know, obviously the whole question of how unique or designy or crazy to make your resume. Um, and of course, it certainly depends on what sort of position you're applying to. Uh, that being said, if we had to <laughs> state a black and white opinion, it would be generally boring is a little more favorable to, uh, right. you know, <laughs> to lean on that side versus really unique and possibly hard to read. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, from your resume, people just want this information of X, right. Y, and Z, what you went through, what kind of stuff do you know? So if you're super concerned about it and you have two different designs and one's a little more designy and crazy and one's a little more boring... We hope we're not overstating our bounds here, but we would say we would probably Prefer push that. you toward the little more boring. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I don't think a boring resume is going to hurt you, really, as long no. as, like, really, and we've said this before, what's most important is your demo reel or portfolio. Yeah. Right. And when we say boring, we mean not the yeah. experience, the experiences that you've had. We mean the, literally the display yes. of the experiences, Actually, yes. like the theme, if you were, you know, if you just put it out on Microsoft Word and listed that out, that's preferable than to have all these colors and crazy fonts. And yeah, that's right. That's what very, we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. I'm <laughs> don't want to. You said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Make it seem we like we don't think anything about you. Is boring. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we're just saying the the layout and configuration ex- of your resume. Yeah. Perfect. Mm-hmm. So this next topic we have is a huge topic. Huge topic. Yeah, this will be the longest one for the episode. <laughs> this will be the longest one for the episode because it's something that so you will take encounter. take a bathroom break right now. Take a, take a, go to the potty. Press <laughs> Grab yourself a uh, critique A red stripe. Oh, yeah, critique <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Critique of Rita. Rita. Not Rita. <laughs> <I'm so sorry. laughs> yeah. The topic is interviews. It's a colossal topic, guys. You're going to encounter one. We've all encountered it. It's huge. We've covered it before in actually previous episodes about our failures and setbacks <laughs> um, of, of us botching interviews, which I highly recommend you guys listen to. I think it was the last episode, depending on when we release this stuff. That's right. Uh, if you're thinking we are too perfect, go check out that episode. <laughs> we will be proven been horribly wrong. You <laughs> absolutely will. I guess I'll start by saying with interviews, the the number one thing, if you if you can remember one thing about this topic, we would say is probably just research the company that you're applying for before the interview and just come up with questions and come up, just kind of be familiar with what they're working on, what you're interested about them, and mm-hmm. just go in knowing that because if you don't, you might you know, make a fool out of yourself and you don't want that. That's the last thing you want. Yeah. Um, going forward, I would say uh, definitely practice answers to questions that you think are likely to come up, which might yes. include, why do you want to work for this company? What are your strengths and weaknesses? What is your previous experience? Anything that is probably a pretty predictable question um, I would absolutely practice the answers to. And I, like personally, I practice in front of the mirror. I practice when I'm driving um, just as kind of like a safe space to just talk it out because you'll, <laughs> um, you'll, you'll flub and you'll kind of catch mm-hmm. the mistakes you make and things that you don't want to say. So I don't think practice hurts at all and you'll just feel more prepared. It's kind of fun in a way, right? <laughs> if you if you kind of take the pressure off yourself to be like, what am I interested in as an artist or as a production person or whatever? And and it's <laughs> yeah, kind of if possible, see it as kind of a fun introspection of you know why yeah. are you in this industry and want to see this thing? I think often we talk about these things so much like they're a chore, and to an extent they are, but. You know, this is an opportunity to examine what really matters to you. And it can be kind of a fun, interesting thing. Kind of tacking on to the research um, point that we made, I would add to definitely practice your answers to kind of predictable interview questions like, why do you want to work for this company? What is your previous experience? What are your strengths and weaknesses? Basically, anything that you kind of expect to come up in an inter- in an interview, I would practice maybe in front of a mirror, maybe in the car. That's 
absolutely something I've done just to kind of work out the kinks of your answers and you'll probably flub and then you'll know kind of like, ooh, like I need to avoid this pitfall. And it just makes you more confident in the interview because you remember like, oh, I wanted to mention this. And I wouldn't shy away from listing your points or brainstorming your answers in like a a Word document or a Google Doc or something. And that's something that you could even kind of have open as you are actively interviewing in like a Skype interview or a, a video chat interview. And I would even recommend like printing it out if you have like an in-person interview and it's something that you can kind of have on hand to, yeah, again, jog your memory. Um, I know a lot of us like will bring sort of like a binder or like a nice leather bound kind of portfolio or folder to kind of have like a bunch of printed resumes on hand and that kind of thing. So that's something, yeah, that you could have that you could put like your kind of go-to answers in to have on hand. Yeah. Totally. And that, I don't think you have to like even keep that secret. Even <laughs> if you wanted to have like some notes of talking points mm-hmm. to have in front of you during an interview, I feel like, I don't know, we haven't talked about this, but I feel like it'd be totally fine to like have that out in an interview and and just say to the interviewer, like, hey, is it okay if I'm just looking at this? I have a couple talking points I wanted to be sure to hit on, you know? And yeah, I think they'd like that. It's totally fine, yeah. yeah. And it shows you're prepared. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And like we all, we've said multiple times in the past, we're all human beings, <laughs> you know, interviewer head of animation at a studio, you know, interviewee, everything. Right. And it's just like, hey, I prepared for this. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. I have this here. I think that's totally fine. Yeah, and w- one thing we wrote down here, it's funny, it's like tone down the fangirl, fanboy <laughs> thing. And and that's that's something it's that's... a tricky one, right? <laughs> it's a tricky one because you, you want to be enthusiastic about the job you're applying for, but you also want to be genuine. And you you don't want to be overwhelmingly enthusiastic to the point where they don't think it's genuine. And again, like we talked about this before, but not wanting to put pressure on the company. So again, avoiding language, which is like, this is my all time favorite company and I don't want to work anywhere else. Like anything like that is definitely kind of dangerous territory. And have you guys had experience doing video interviews? I've never had one, but I know it must be, a little more awkward than like a in-person interview. <laughs> totally, a little more, yeah. <laughs> a lot more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've had a few video interviews along the way. Um, and advice I would give about video interviews would include make sure that your connection is secure and try to definitely yeah. like be online well before the interview is scheduled. Right. Um, I would make sure there's nothing kind of embarrassing in the background, like try to keep like a fairly blank um, <laughs> background so it's not distracting. Um, I would, I've done this in the past. I literally like put, photos of my cats on the desktop like (laughs) just to kind of calm me down and put me in a positive space so you can actively like put something that will tell you to like should we link to photos of our cats (laughs) (laughs) podcast if you need check out our cats (laughs) (laughs) they'll make you feel cats on your desktop (laughs) Um, (laughs) um and this one's a little embarrassing which is something I actually do for both video interviews and in-person interviews, but I like actively try to make myself laugh just to kind of lighten the mood, make myself feel genuine. Like the smiles are genuine and, and there's something psychologically about laughing that like calms you down. So I literally like just force myself to laugh. Um, And you can do things like power stances, which I don't know. I believe in it. I think it like makes yourself more confident just to like put your hands on your hips and like make a Superman pose and um, yeah, take a deep (laughs) breath and um, just kind of try to calm yourself down. Meditation is totally valid. Like try to meditate before an interview just to kind of get control of your breathing and your heart rate. All of this I think will be super valuable. And I love what one of you guys wrote here, which is like, if you botch the interview in some way, if there's some element that you messed up, it's okay to 
you know, in your thank you note, which we're going to talk about, like to, to address it, to say, I'm sorry, guys, I was a little nervous about this one thing, but um, that's a great opportunity to sort of correct any sort of issues that might have happened in the interview, which might relieve some pressure if you know that even going going into the interview being like, it's not like the end all be all if yeah. you 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 don't have to be like the perfect human. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> we you know, in our failures episode, we talk about how disastrous some of our interviews was but sometimes we got an offer at these yeah. companies and right. yeah. i think they respond to uh, maybe they respond to to genuine anxiety <laughs> <laughs> right. i don't know well i think i think that's a really good point and even if in an interview you were to say like you know what guys i'm so sorry i'm very nervous yeah. because i'm passionate about this job mm. you know a few minutes ago you asked you asked me about X, Y, and Z, <laughs> right. and I said this, but I wish I had said this. It, that's totally fine. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, these, like we say a trillion times before, everybody in these involved with these things are human beings, mm-hmm. and we all totally understand that interviews are super uncomfortable. They're stressful, and, yeah. Yeah. So the biggest thing are just that you're an effective communicator right. and that you're okay or easy to get along with. And if even, and sometimes that means even changing your mind and admitting yeah. that you're wrong at times and be like, Hey, you know, what? I said this, I'm so sorry. I would right. love to go back to that because just, and just admit to say like, yeah, I'm super nervous because this is really <laughs> exciting and you know, a lot of pressure. Yeah, right. exactly. And everybody would be like, that totally makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interview. It's okay to be nervous. Nobody is expecting you to be this, you know, Perfect. rock star where you have to be right on the money all yeah. the time. And everyone knows, honestly. Right. I, I talked to Guillermo a lot, and he's one of the integral uh, members of the real review team and interviewing team at DreamWorks. And he absolutely is aware aware of that every single time during an interview. Yeah. That like you know we know it's uncomfortable, we right. know it's tough, so we're just looking for you know whatever you can offer in terms of you know <laughs> personality and and being easy to talk to and work with is it's, is fine. It's tough because sometimes nervousness can um, manifest in ways that seem negative so it's like it's almost like it's hard because you have to channel that nervousness in a way that seems like you're nervous yeah (laughs) and not that you're overconfident or not that you're cocky or i don't know that's that's a really tough one a really good point because i have heard of people in the past who it seemed like oh they seemed like they were almost too cool and like didn't probably talk about yeah whatever with the interview and it was and i you know, knowing these people, it was totally because they were just kind of on edge and they didn't want to risk yeah. talking too much because, you know, so they they gave kind of short answers and, and looked almost <laughs> overly comfortable and were <laughs> slumped back in their chair and, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, yeah, when, when in doubt, just err on the side of honesty, yeah. right? And yeah. be like, you know, I'm so sorry if anything comes off as weird. You know, I, I am very nervous, but I'm grateful yeah. for this opportunity to chat with you guys and just speak from the heart, yeah. you know? I think Great. this kind of is starting to touch upon another point which we wrote down, which is sort of the soft skills involved with an interview, which – is a big topic and it's a tricky topic because soft skills are something that is very specific to your personality and it's kind of hard to learn or it's hard to teach. But generally, soft skills involve things like wanting to have an engaged posture and wanting to make sort of the appropriate amount of eye contact where it's not too much eye contact and it's not too little eye contact. <laughs> um, and... Yeah, like you were saying, like not answering in one word sentences, like being able to kind of elaborate on your answer and keeping the conversation flowing um, and generally giving <laughs> like nonverbal cues or reading nonverbal cues. So if an interviewer is talking, like sort of nodding along as they are talking, which basically like showing your engaged Without, right, like being too intense. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's that very of. well said. Yeah, um, and this kind of stems back to the point you made about balancing confidence and humility. Like you, absolutely, that's 
that's definitely a soft skill, I would say, which is like trying to show that you're confident in your abilities, but not overstepping the bounds of like, I'm the best number one candidate for this job, no matter what. All that being said, I will say like animation is a very forgiving industry. There is a very wide range of personalities (laughs) within our industry with definitely more eccentric personalities, more introverted personalities. So I mean, don't put too much pressure on yourself to like change your personality. Can be perfect all the yeah. time. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I think the biggest thing is like, <laughs> as long as you're not mean, right? Yes. <laughs> you're I like, agree. yeah, yeah. you're don't like mean. 70% of the way there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> be nice <laughs> than within that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I know this is kind of silly, but. What do you wear for an interview? Oh yeah, <laughs> we didn't talk about this. It's it's, it's a it big sounds question. dumb, but yeah, it, yeah, it, it could be dumb. But it is the one question that every single person has to deal with going to the interview, <laughs> right? <laughs> you got to wear something. Yeah. So let's start with saying you have to have something on your body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, girls, guys, what do we do? What do we do? Have a tequila Rita, and then uh... <laughs> critique Rita. Critique. <laughs> what did I just say? Tequila Rita. <laughs> Keep, keep keep it in a thousand percent. Okay, if you're if you're a guy, Ben, yeah. you're a guy. What do you wear? <laughs> sort of, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> what would you, my friend, I, wear uh, as a man? I, in a I don't want to ping pong it right back to you, but I'm oh, cheating a little bit God. because we were talking about this before we we were recording, and I said, Garrett, you have worked at <laughs> two of the top top companies. You were at DreamWorks for a while. You're at Disney now, great success in your life. Tell me what you were wearing during those interviews. So I think a safe thing to wear, and I think what I wore for my DreamWorks interview, I'm thinking about it right now, was khaki pants and a button-down shirt. God, I think that's... <laughs> ben, <laughs> ben looks so excited right now when I'm looking at him. It's a super uh, safe bet. You yeah. know, you button-down shirt and it's already a little more formal khaki pants and then some like nice shoes or whatever i don't know i think that's it sounds safe yeah, right i think you can go wrong i don't know yeah something we talk about a lot is like overdressing for an interview yeah <laughs> and you know it's totally a valid thing to be worried about that's fine but i want to reassure anyone who is super worried about it that you would never <laughs> i think i can safely say you guys can correct Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I can safely say you would never be like not offered a job because because you were too well dressed. No, yeah. absolutely. They would not. just be yeah. like, "Wow, so and so seemed pretty like <laughs> you know, well right. prepared or into this." It might raise some eyebrows, but they would never not offer you because you're overdressed. Whereas being underdressed could reflect a little more negatively. That's on a you. great like, point. You didn't care about the interview. Maybe your heart's not really in it. So. If you're super nervous, like like Garrett was saying, I think kind of the upper middle ground is great where you're kind of dressed up, not super intensely for specific, definitely this, for artistic Yeah, that's a great right? thing to mention. Maybe for production, it's right. a little different, which maybe we can talk about that. Katie would know Maybe more. not different. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what Katie says in a second. But um, for artistic positions in particular, yeah, I think just like dressing nicely. Just nice. Which, yeah. Uh, is is a very safe bet. Uh, I mean, I would say something similar for production positions, or for if you're if you identify as female and you're trying to figure out what to wear, is generally err on the side of more professional. Um, I I don't think you should shy away from heels. It's not a requirement. I I think a dress is fine. A pantsuit is fine. Just anything that's pretty professional um, would be appropriate. And um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think if there would be a distinction between production management or an artist. I guess the only distinction I would make is maybe if you're an artist, you want to show a little bit of like your fun or sure. creative side. Or personality. Yeah, so maybe you mm. want to show like a fun print or something like that. Whereas for um, a production management position, maybe you err on the side of more like business attire. Mm-hmm. Um, right. But there's no hard and fast rule. I just, again, like we said, would err on the side of more dressed up than underdressed. Mm-hmm. Can you give us a snapshot? <laughs> what, 
Let me set the scene. It's 2017, early 2017. Oh, snap. Was it 2016? I don't oh, think it right. was. Wait, well, it depends on which interview we're talking we're about. We're talking about Disney. Oh, okay. Okay. It's 2017. Katie walks in. Katie Lowe. What's she wearing? To Disney. She walks into <laughs> Disney, so, interviewing for production assistant position. Yes. On Wreck-It Ralph 2. So something I wore was I had basically a pantsuit. I think I wore black um, skinny jeans, a button-down shirt, and a blazer, and heels. And my button-down oh. shirt had polka dots. To show oh, I was a little bit fun. That is a little bit fun. And the blazer was to show I'm professional. The heels was to show I'm professional. And then the jeans I tried to include to like balance. Not oh my gosh, there was fancy. so much thought. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was it was oh like my a gosh. dark wash of jeans, right? Yeah, like they were black. Like Can we provide yeah. a picture of this? Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> this is like more. Th- yeah. This is. An- no, I'm not saying you have to dress this way, but you have to dress like- this way. <laughs> That's what we're saying. Walk the line between fun and professional. Yeah. Uh, no, I think that's, that's great. Yeah. Perfect example, right? Yeah. You, you explain the thought process behind <laughs> literally every piece you were wearing. <laughs> and no, that's, that's really yeah. valuable. Amazing. And when in doubt, send pictures to friends and family. Totally. And get a gauge on like, oh, does this look better? Um, yeah. I think the last thing that I wanted to mention is just a very logistical point to interviewing, which is if you have an in-person interview, make sure to bring copies of your resume. Um, And also, if you're an artist, make sure to bring examples of your work just to have handy because you never know like if the people you're interviewing with are actually familiar with who you are. I've been in interviews before where people are literally reading my resume in front of me because they had didn't have familiarity with who I was as a candidate. That's before. crazy. Yeah. So <laughs> it's you just want to come prepared and um, yeah, make sure you have all that information if they request it. Yeah, and that's a good point because sometimes what will happen at companies is you know the recruiter approves mm-hmm. of a person and then you know there's a real review or whatever sort of review. Um, and people are like, yeah, let's bring he or she or whatever in for an interview. Mm-hmm. And then the people interviewing may not have been in on those other meetings. And they're just like, oh, I was just brought in for an interview. So like Katie said, they might be reading your resume for the first time yeah. or something. Right. And, yeah, I'm not saying that's the norm, but it is certainly something to be prepared it's for because it is not, yeah, mm-hmm. it's not out of the ordinary. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. So one of the other other things we wanted to mention on this subject is, you know, if you've gone through the interview process, if you're privileged enough to be, you know, talking to a company mm-hmm. and going through that whole thing, thank you notes are yeah, super huge. important. Yeah. yeah. I know we've all dealt with this. Um, Katie, is there anything you want to talk about in particular with this? Yeah. Um, I would say it's very good practice to write thank you notes. You generally want to address it to the people you interviewed with. You don't necessarily have to write a thank you note for each individual person you interviewed with. Like my production management interview, I think I interviewed with like 15 people. Oh so I think God. it <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty acceptable to re- to address your thank you note to everyone you interviewed. Right. Um, and if you don't have the email addresses of those people, you can direct a thank you note to the recruiter and say, hey, like if you wouldn't mind, it would be great if you could forward this thank you note to uh, my interviewers and that kind of thing. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just absolutely good practice to shoot a thank you note for people's time and for the thought they put into the interview. I individually or personally treat the thank you note as an opportunity to elaborate on anything that maybe I botched in the interview or that I kind of wish had come up in the interview, but didn't come up. And I like wanted to mention, um, so it's, I don't think having like a, a longer, uh, thank you note is a problem. It shows that you're putting like careful thought into the thank you note and, yeah, I don't, it can't hurt. Anything to add? That's a really good point. That I think that it shouldn't necessarily only be seen as an obligation. It really is an opportunity for mm-hmm. you to say, like, you know, oh, the 
the interview went this way. I wish I had the opportunity to mention this about myself mm-hmm. or my background or, or this specific reason why I want to work at this particular company. Um, it is this extra, yeah, fantastic opportunity to, you know, not only does it reflect well on you that you're taking the time to write this thing after mm-hmm. the interview, uh, it's also, yeah, this great little platform for you to kind of sell yourself even more. So. Yeah, it's great for <laughs> multiple reasons. Yeah, totally. and you might have a question on like, should I send an online email thank you note or should I send a handwritten thank you note? I I think it's safe to say just send an email because yeah. um, even a handwritten note like addressed to the studio, I know at least at Disney, like the mail is sorted into mailboxes. And frankly, I think it's a once in a blue moon that people actually check their mail. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I know. Have you ever checked your I mail? I don't even Garrett? know I had that access to <laughs> Garrett, you have so much mail. For you. <laughs> so, From <wait>. me. <laughs> yeah. I think it's safe and never frowned upon to just send an email. Thank you. Now. Yeah. Yeah, That's super, and maybe if yeah. you really, if the spirit compels you <laughs> to write a thank you note, uh, handwritten, I would say also write an email, right? Because you're more guaranteed that'll find its mark, and then maybe in the handwritten email say like, or handwritten <laughs> letter <Sure. laughs> say like, hey, I know I emailed you, but X Y Z, I wanted yeah. to also write this letter because of whatever. Because yeah, you're right. You you just have no guarantee, and I certainly don't check my mailbox at DreamWorks. Yeah, or, yeah. And no. I mean, maybe a handwritten note makes more sense if you're like already internally there, and then you can like personally deliver it or that kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's very safe to just send an email thank you note. So actually, speaking of this, Garrett, I'm interested. I know. I think a while ago, you and I kind of compared notes about when we both interviewed at DreamWorks. And I think there was some difference in who you sent your (laughs) thank you notes to versus who I did. Or how how did that work for you? I think for DreamWorks specifically, I sent out thank you notes via email to individually to every person I interviewed with. So I think I interviewed with four people. And I don't know how I got access to their emails. It might have been a thing where I saw on LinkedIn that the format was like first name, period, last name mm-hmm. at DreamWorks Animation. But I think yeah. it's interesting at DreamWorks or at Disney, uh, they were very explicit about they didn't want the thank you notes to happen individually to oh, the really? emails. I remember oh, it being yeah. like it goes through recruitment. So okay. it was like you need to email recruitment you know, your thoughts, and then they'll hand that off. When you were applying to DreamWorks, was it similar or? So for me, it was, it sounded like how it was for Disney, where I, Mm. I was not, I was in no way like warned, hey, don't reach out to these people. But for the animation job, um, it was six people I interviewed with, and it was three different interviews. Each one was like a half hour long. Oh, wow. Um, and I felt like I, I don't know if I did some research or what, but I, I don't remember exactly, but I, I didn't have all of their emails. Right. Um, so I just emailed back the main recruiter I had been oh, talking to. Okay. And I said, hey, could you please pass this, along, this along to the interviewing mm-hmm. team? And I put in like a general email about like, appreciate you interviewing me, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And then I tried to hit a couple specific points about like, hey, I just wanted to reiterate, I'm interested in DreamWorks because of X, Y, and Z. Um, I feel like my, you know, past experience has prepared me because of, again, X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, and just kind of kept it that way and kind of made it, kind of <laughs> made it, tried to make it uh, specific to DreamWorks, yet general enough that it could kind of apply to all the people that interviewed me. So, yeah, that's did, the way I played it there. Did you ever hear about the people finally getting your message later, or was it? That's dip- a good question. Actually, I'd be no, curious. I did not. Okay. I w- I'll have to ask Guillermo because he was <laughs> one of one my. Of yeah, right. he was one of my interviewers. Uh, <laughs> That's so funny. I'll have to see what he. Yeah, if he ever got that. But yeah, I right. sent it definitely only to the uh, recruiter and got said, it. "Hey, could you please pass this along to?" They you? probably did. I'm sure they did. Um, yeah. So the next thing we wanted to talk about is applying to a job when you already have one. That's a tricky thing because you it's a balance, right? Like you don't want to, 
you know, offend the company that you're currently employed with while you're looking for work. <laughs> it's a really, really tricky thing. Um, but you're going to encounter this once you're in the, once you're in the industry. Mm-hmm. Um, the, one of the biggest things we wanted to say about this subject is really don't be public about you know, you applying to another job until you have a firm offer and a, until you've accepted probably the yeah, offer. Yeah. Like, be pretty private about that. Uh, might be common sense, but... <laughs> and maybe even then, not until you're at that yeah. company, even if you've <laughs> right. accepted. Because or you're like, you've given your notice or... Yeah, yeah. right. But still, even it, it's not out of the ordinary, for better or for worse, for a company to make an offer and then rescind it because things change. Oh, right? that's so a very good point. I would say yeah. once you're there you're at the company, you're there, you're working, mm-hmm. maybe then post it for grandma and grandpa to see. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I've actually, I've sort of been in this position a little bit because I was a PA at Disney and I decided to apply to the animation apprenticeship. And it was sort of like, A little bit tricky territory because I didn't want to seem ungrateful for my PA opportunities, which I loved being a PA at Disney. I had a very, really great experience um, working in all the departments that I assisted. Um, And it was sort of like a stretch opportunity and kind of um, just on a whim that I applied to the apprenticeship. So I didn't want to risk offending anybody that I worked with as um, in production management because I really didn't know like if I had a shot at the apprenticeship or anything like that. So I was very careful about kind of who I mentioned it to. Um, and I think, yeah, generally erring on the side of being more private is, yeah, a, is good advice. One thing we wanted to also bring up is try to, you know, when you're, if you're considering leaving your studio for another job, try to be respectful of the current project you're on and, Mm -hmm. you know, give ample time and notice before leaving. Like you, you don't want to burn bridges, no matter how upset you are, or if you're upset with the current company you're at, you just want to leave on good terms. Uh, And to kind of focus on, Hey, I'm, I'm doing this because this is kind of best for me at this point of my career or life, you know, but I'm very appreciative of, you know, totally, you know, the experience of it. I've had an X, Y, and Z. Guillermo touched on this a little bit with interviewing people, and you don't necessarily, just because you're interviewing with a different company, you don't necessarily want to start like crapping on your old company. Absolutely. And be like, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's terrible there. I'll do anything to leave. Be, <laughs> you know, it's because you don't want the new company to think that, oh, gosh. If they're not having a great time, they're going to totally sell us out and start looking for another company right away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think even if you are having a tough time, it would be best to kind of frame your, uh, frame the conversation in a way to say, you know, oh, I'm very grateful for where I am right now. There are a couple challenges this company faces that I've been struggling with that are X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in working for your company because I think it has, you know, again, X, Y, and Z that is beneficial about it. Um, But I recognize that, you know, (laughs) there are difficulties in any position. So, again, just basically, however you want to phrase it, but I would hesitate to say, you know, my current company sucks. And no, yeah. I hate it. You know, yeah, it's a, it's not stupid a good idea. because of whatever. And I would, I mean, I would be frank and say like, unless somebody asks you point blank, why do you want to leave your company? You don't have to mention it. You don't have right. to. Yeah, that's a very good point. And they yeah. probably won't why? talk yeah. about that. It can just be more positives about the new company yeah. rather yep. than negatives about the old company. For yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I would say also, like, you kind of talked, Ben, about, like, the possibility of a company rescinding their offer. Mm -hmm. And this is another reason why you don't want to offend the company that you're currently at is because you literally might be in a position where a company extends your job offer and you're preparing to leave your current company and then the the new company rescinds the offer and you don't, and you realize, oh crap, I want to stay at the company I'm currently yeah. at. 
Um, so that's yeah. A, and that is not out of very the ordinary real world in animation. Yeah. Mean, right. That's... That happens a lot, you know? I mean, different companies are mm-hmm. afforded a certain amount of funding for a certain amount mm-hmm. of time, and then when they get to a certain uh kind of checkpoint, they check in and see if they'll get more funding to continue on or not. Or and, there is a story problem or something so they postpone the release date or something like that yeah so i guess just know that things are very in flux yeah almost all the time and to plan on a little bit of you know yeah that and not being able to depend on things 100 percent, no matter what nothing almost nothing is concrete Mm -hmm. and um we certainly don't say that to discourage anyone, but to just be aware of it. And it is a, re- it is a reality of the industry. So mm-hmm. be aware of that. Uh, the next thing we wanted to talk about was negotiating and juggling offers. If that's something that is Ew. happening with you, which is a amazing Congratulations. thing. Get Congratulations. Get that extra money. <laughs> extra money. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing with negotiating and, you know, if, say if so, a studio is interested in you, um, this might be obvious, but kind of research the salary expectations that this company or this position might have of you. And this is a little tricky. We talked about this earlier, and it's it's hard to research salary because, you know, gla- everyone talks about Glassdoor, but we all we've all had experiences where Glassdoor is not exactly accurate with yeah. the current. It might be a little out of date. It's it yeah. could be out of it date. Have it, extremes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it could be that's a very good point that lows. Not everyone highs. in the industry is like required to contribute to Glassdoor. So you never know. Yeah, maybe the people contri- contributing there are particularly upset about their salaries. So they go on glass right. and they report them or they're particularly happy with their salaries. So <laughs> they talk about them on Glassdoor. Um, it should be seen as a resource and not the Bible. The resource. For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah for not sure. the and, That was a much better way of saying it. <laughs> no, and it no. was right there in front of me and I missed out on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. A resource, not a the, resource. That, yeah. It's okay. It's Let's okay. Garrett. We've had too many uh, critique <laughs> to yes, yeah. think straight. Maybe just the right amount. Maybe just the right amount. The, the reason we're talking about researching salary is that's the number one thing. Like, you know, knowing what a position pays as your best defense and best way to ask for something. And Glassdoor, we talked about maybe not being the most accurate. One of the, If you're an artist in particular, if you're an animator, storyboard artist, whatever, there's another resource, which is the Animation Guild. They have a minimum um, sort of guideline of of what people make hourly, which we can provide, which we will provide in the show notes. We can link to it. It's very much Los Angeles based um, pay scales, Mm -hmm. but uh, I think probably the best bet is to sort of talk to people that you know who are in these positions and sort of ask, ask people who you know, like what they're, what they're making or is that, is that inappropriate? I mean, I think we're all like pretty, transparent about it like we want to help people we ultimately it helps everyone if we know what the other person's making because right. like, yeah. we don't want to find out that oh my gosh we have the same level experience and you're, you're making, making 20 times. yeah exactly yeah. so i i think a lot of us in the industry have a pretty healthy attitude about wanting everyone to make the most that they can make and Absolutely. generally being fairly transparent about salary and yeah believing in that a rising tide raises all ships right that hopefully yeah. if we're all paid the a little bit that's going to be a quote that we put in the Instagram. <laughs> right. Rising tide raises all ships. That attributed it. directly to Ben Gearman. Nobody else has said that before. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Yeah. That's a very no. common phrase that, no, that many want, other people have I said. I mean, granted, but. you might come across certain people that are squeamish about reporting their salary, but it, just try to get a gauge on people. If you have a pretty safe friendship or relationship with someone, I think it's okay and, to ask. And as a podcast, I think we're in the position... Because all of the influence we have, <laughs> no, we have no influence. We do have a lot, but we, but I I think it's important, kind of, to be transparent about this stuff. Yeah, part of the reason that I think it can be very valuable for people to share their salaries is that 
you know, on one hand, it's it's very intimate knowledge of your life, and it's very, it's this very private thing, so it can feel very revealing, and you can feel very vulnerable for telling someone yeah. if you're making. Go ahead. Like it's revealing of like your negotiation. Your yeah, absolutely, abilities. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, if I'm being it's like, paid oh my god, less, it's because I was I failed to ask for more or yes. right. um, convince the company that I needed more. A- yeah. Absolutely. Which is right. vulnerable. Yeah. But we can also say in this podcast that your what you're being paid does not reflect your work. Your artistic yeah. value. One hundred percent. I love that you said that. A thousand billion million right? percent. It's important. Do not worry. <laughs> it's important because we million. know. <laughs> <laughs> we know that right now, incredible, amazing, some of the most talented artists we know are be- being paid less than artists we know who do not have as much experience or who are not contributing quite as much as right. the people I was just talking about. And that is not, I do not say that as a critique to the people who are making more. That's more power to you. Right. That's fantastic. But the reality is pay scale does not automatically reflect value to the company. No. And we do not say this to be like bitter toward any company or no. anything. Yeah. It's just, it's a reality. Yeah. How much you negotiate right. is very much in a lot of ways separate to what you bring to the team and the company and they're very variable. And, and it's know? hugely yeah. based on luck and timing. Right. Yes. Like yeah. how desperate a company is to fill positions Um directly ties to how much they're willing to pay newcomers right? Um, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. We even put here salaries range hugely. And w- when we say that it's not, it's ridiculous. Like, yeah. We, <laughs> how much does an animator make guys? Oh, between $20,000 a year and $300,000 a year. Yeah. Like literally, literally right? <laughs> that is a range. Huge. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. And certainly we can give more specific ranges to, okay, you're an animator with three years of experience in the feature film world. Maybe you're more within this range. You know, we gave the extremes right there, you know, very, give or take, give yeah. or take. but um, mm-hmm. just know that, you know, it's, right. it's not, out of the ordinary to have a quote unquote senior animator and one of them is making eighty five thousand dollars a year and one of them is making a hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. You know, that's right. like totally within the realm of possibility. It is. And that's a huge yeah. And again it's the wild west. Again, I'm gonna say it again. And we've said it multiple times. We do not fault any studio no. for what they're paying someone. Um it is every studio's obligation to be doing whatever they can to ensure that they are profitable right healthy and ultimately that's great because that means jobs for other people and we love that again reach out to people at the company even better reach out to people that just had the position you got accepted for um, and try to see okay what did they offer that person um, so that means I can probably safely request that amount or a little bit more than that amount. Yeah. yeah. On the topic of negotiation, like one of the best positions that you can be in is juggling multiple offers yes. or um, sort of leveraging a new offer against your current position. And um, basically what this entails is, um, yeah, you can kind of put, companies against each other and say, hey, like, oh, I just received this offer from this studio. I'm heavily considering it. Like, do you guys want to counter that? Or like, would you be able to offer more? And and that kind of thing. I mean, oh, no, it's a good privilege. It's a great position to be in. And it's rare. Obviously, if you're in that position, congratulations. That's fantastic. Yeah. Because that's amazing. And obviously, we want to say the same as always, be grateful for right. both offers, yes. right? Mm-hmm. But the reality is, yeah, what Katie was saying, you're saying, hey, this company says I am worth, as a human being, <laughs> you know, $30 an hour. 
Right. Are you saying I'm worth more? Because that will make me want to work for you more. Right. <laughs> and like that's that's a very oversimplified way to talk about it because obviously there are multiple factors of what sort of work the company is doing, where you would be living, you know, all those things. But mm-hmm. that's reality. And there's a way to very respectfully do that. Yeah. Right. Where you could be like, hey, I'm so grateful that you're taking the time mm-hmm. to make me an offer and I would love to work at the company. But, you know, logistically, this other one offered me $5 an hour more. Is there anything you can do? Could you bring it close to that or more than that or something to encourage me to work there? Because, you know, just by the (laughs) X's and O's or whatever, it makes more sense for me to be at the other company, even though I really like what you're doing. And just try to keep it super objective and respectful as possible, you know. Again, walking that line between confidence and humility and, yeah, just being grateful for the offer. Um, not assuming that they'll give you more, but just putting it out there that yeah. you have multiple offers and you're weighing your options. Yeah, for sure. So on the topic of negotiations and applying to jobs, we kind of wanted to talk about the hold system. Uh, we think it's important to bring this up because it's something you definitely uh, you could encounter, I should say, if you're freelancing in a major city like New York or Los Angeles um, and maybe even some other cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, It's a little confusing, the whole system, but it's basically an unofficial agreement between studios and freelancers that helps the studio ensure that you will be available when they need you for a job. So if a studio is interested in potentially hiring you, uh, potentially is the key word, they might ask you for a first hold. We want to emphasize that a first hold does not mean you are hired. It just means that the studio has the right, sorry, the first right to hire you in the agreed time period. So in layman's terms, it's basically dibs is what I'm catching. So if a studio wants a first hold from you, they basically want the first dibs from you (laughs) to your time. Uh, And that way they know that you're going to be available and ready to work for them if they decide to book you. Um, And a booking would mean that they're officially hiring you, but... Uh, first hold doesn't mean that. It's just sort of dibs. But yeah. as best as I and can understand it. It's all unofficial, too, we should say. It's not a um, legal mm-hmm. thing. So just to give you an example, we'll do a little role-playing here. <laughs> where, <laughs> very innocent role-playing where we'll say Garrett is a new animator, fresh out of school, and he has kind of sent his reel around. He's looking for some freelance work. And I am a recruiter at a studio. And I know we have some projects coming up here, let's say for October. And so I'm looking to staff up for, you know, let's say it's a commercial that's happening in October. Um, But I'm not exactly sure of our financing and stuff yet at the studio. So I'm not officially sending out offers, but I want to make sure people are available uh, during that time. Right. So I might reach out to Garrett and say, hey, you know, I saw your reel. I like it. Like what you got, man. (laughs) And we have this project in October that we're, you know, thinking about staffing up for. So I would like to formally request a first hold for you for the month of October. Yeah. And me being a new animator, I have no idea what that means. But (laughs) luckily, I just listened to this episode. So now I know. (laughs) And I agree to a first hold for the month of October in this scenario. And what this basically means is I'm on call for this entire time period. Um, So I have to sort of make myself available so that if Ben decides to officially book me, I'm ready. So then what happens if, say, I, Katie, from another studio, reach out to you to try to book you for my commercial in October? And what if I am actually ready with the financing and can book you as opposed to putting a hold on you? What would you do then, Garrett, fresh out of school (laughs) animator? (laughs) Best situation ever, basically. (laughs) Yeah, so I guess what I would do in that scenario is um, I would let... Katie, no. Oh, I have a first hold uh, with a company already, but let me Mm -hmm. check with them. And then I'd contact Ben and I'd say, you know, look, Ben, uh, I I got a booking offer from this other company. And you could you please release the first hold or could you actually book me? Um, Because I have to give Ben the first right to 
to refusal for or the first right, I should say, to um, to hire you to hire me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I was asking for when I asked for the first hold. Was basically this scenario that he mm-hmm. he kind of has promised <laughs> has promised himself to me. I don't know how, <laughs> how to say Keep that this in a weird way. Going. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> but uh, now that he has that second offer. Uh, I'm obligated to either officially book him so he knows he's going to get paid for that month of October Mm -hmm. um, or officially release him so now he can, uh, Katie can book him. Now, hopefully that's making sense. Um, We can kind of talk about like what a second hold means really quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, if say like I've been working in the industry for a few years and I'm more of like a mid-level animator, maybe studios are constantly reaching out to me for work. Um, and let's say, you know, Ben asks for a first hold for me for the month of October in this scenario, what, uh, do I do? Well, maybe I'm pretty experienced now and I don't like giving first holds. I mean, the reason why if you're more experienced, a first hold might not be good is because you're sort of totally on call for that scenario. So you can't take vacations. You can't do anything. You have to really be be available for that month. And in addition to that, there's no guarantee that Ben will book me. So it's like, I'm on the hold for this time. And I kind of there's no guarantee that I'll get a job. So if I'm experienced, I might not want to give out a first hold. So I might give him a second hold. And that means I already have a first hold, whether or not that's actually true, doesn't matter, but I already have a first hold and Ben is number two in terms of priority. So if Ben later decides to book me, I have the opportunity to say no because of my first hold. So yeah, we've presented this all to you, but you know, just talking about things practically, when you're just starting out in the industry, um, it's probably smartest to just go ahead and give companies a first hold because ultimately, you know, you're trying to build your network, you're, you know, any opportunity is a good opportunity for the most part. And you want to show, you know, possible recruiters and producers that um, you're reliable and you're willing to work. And yeah, you just kind of want to, you know, get whatever experience you can. So definitely when you're starting out, you can, you can kind of err on that side. And then with the whole system we talked about with only giving companies second holds or, or, I guess even lower second or third holds. Um, that's kind of more something for after you've kind of built your network and you feel comfortable with, yeah, what you're being able to book jobs and stuff and, and you can have a little more independence. And I guess we should just reiterate to be ultra clear, like nothing about a first or second hold is a guaranteed offer or an official booking. So you're not legally required to honor them. Mm -hmm. Like you haven't signed a contract or anything like that. But if you do not honor them, you simply risk the or you simply risk burning a bridge with the company that you gave those holds to. So that's really kind of what's at stake there. I think we've kind of covered everything that we had jotted down for applying to jobs and professionalism and that kind of thing. So uh, listeners, if you have any additional questions, absolutely shoot them our way. Like send us an Instagram message, totally. send us an email, animationhappyhour@gmail.com, and we will do our best to get back to your questions. But yeah, I think that brings us to the next segment. Tip Joe! All right. Tip jar for this month, I should say, is optimize your scene, guys. And um, what that means is, you know, if you're in Maya, for instance, you're animating a scene, hide everything in your scene view except your geo, right? Because that's going to really speed up the playback. And that's the biggest thing when you're animating is having a good frame rate while you're scrubbing while you're playing stuff back um and this might seem like an obvious thing but you know i still run into it at disney where i'm like okay i have too many things visible and it's like okay things are slow i don't know if you encounter that too yeah like you want to generally kind of hide your environment maybe hide clothing yeah or x-gen if like a character has hair right like eyebrow hair or that kind of thing all that stuff will slow down your scene Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And kind of the good gut check, which Garrett started to mention, is like you want your your scene to scrub cleanly. Like you don't want to see a lag. Um, you kind of want it to feel like it's real time, like the character is moving. Um, and there's a way to see what frame rate the scene is playing to. Right. Um, which is 
uh, what is the exact? You display, it's 24 frames per second, but you can yeah. display the frame rate per yeah. second. Um, I think it's display, uh, heads up display settings, and you can do yeah. the frame rate. You can show like a, like screenshots of how to set this up um, yeah. in the show right. notes. Um, and yeah, you want to check it, like what frame rate things are playing and um yeah, I generally hide anything that's not absolutely necessary. I know like certain rigs, especially the public rigs, they might not have pickers. So like you might not want to hide like the controls, which might be polygons. Oh, right. right. Yeah, there might be some. Yeah. So that's generally, true. yeah, you might want to like show polygons but or nerves curves or something. Yeah. You might want to show nerves curves, but anything else you might not want. You, you might just want like the ground plane and like nothing else. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of the whole like death by a thousand paper cuts thing too, right? Like any tiny, tiny thing you can do to mm-hmm. optimize your scene yep. ultimately can make a huge difference. Even if it's like I'm hiding this little thing and it saves one one hundredth of a second <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Over the course of like four weeks, if you're right. working on a run of shots mm-hmm. or a couple shots, like that's it can save hours and hours and hours. So yeah, yeah. whatever you can do, do it. Absolutely. Yeah, unload yeah. textures, like anything. Yeah. Just yeah. in your scene. That brings us to the end of this episode. If there's anything that we didn't touch upon or we didn't mention, absolutely, again, send us your questions. We are on all of the social media platforms you can think of, Instagram, Twitter. We have our Gmail running, the Animation Happy Hour, or excuse me, Animation Happy Hour at gmail.com. We have a Facebook page. Absolutely reach out to us in whatever form is most convenient for you. We want to hear your feedback. We want to hear your comments. We want to hear your questions. Um, And hopefully we'll address whatever you send us in a future episode. Yeah, and so I guess that is wrapping up the episode that we had today about applying to jobs. This has been Garrett. And Katie. Thanks for listening. And happy animating.